So yes, I'm so happy to have Frances McDonald with us today. Frances is a co-founder and president of Canorland Minerals, a North American exploration company which focuses on identifying greenfields exploration opportunities and advancing them through either sole funding or partner funding. So Canorland has recently discovered the Regnault gold deposit by using till geochemistry and prospecting in an Archean greenstone belt in Quebec, uh, Canada, which was thought to have been heavily prospected in the past. So with his experience, it is going to be great hearing from him today about exploration risk, a case for utilising the project generator business model. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And uh, so, yeah, I guess just just introduce the title of the talk. So exploration risk, a case for using uh, utilising the project generator business model. So. I stuck a disclaimer in here. There'll be one or two forward-looking statements at the end. Um, not too many, I won't inundate you with those. So I'll start out just with defining what we're talking about. So exploration risk. And there's a number of different ways you can think about exploration risk. Uh, I've stuck in a few talking points here. So political risk. Uh, this might be that you may not get permits that are needed. There might be opposition from local landowners or resources might be nationalized by, by national governments. You could talk about resource risk, and that would be the risk that the continuity of a resource is not what you modeled or that your grade assumptions were wrong. Engineering risk, I've stuck in a picture of the Diavik diamond mine, which is underneath the big lake um, in the middle of the Northwest Territories here in Canada. And so engineering risk is something I think that you really have to think about from the earliest stages of exploration because you have to decide whether you want to explore in an area that might be logistically challenged. Um, and then what I'll be talking about mostly today is, is what I'm calling discovery risk. And so this is the risk that a mineral deposit is not where you think it is. So when talking about exploration discovery risk, there's three things that I'm going to be focusing on, and that's location risk. And so this is the risk of exploring in the wrong place. And I think there's really two ways to think about that. It's geological prospectivity and then exploration maturity. Targeting risk is the second box. And so I'll be talking about five targeting tool sets that we can use and the risks uh, that are inherent in each of those. And then financial risk. And so this is what the, the, the cost of making a real discovery. And then also I'll be talking about the project generator business model. And so what is this in case people aren't familiar with this, this model? So the project generator differs from a traditional junior exploration company uh, because they have multiple projects. So this could be anywhere from two or three up to 20 or 30 different projects. Uh, the, the goal is to discover multiple deposits and the risk profile um, is such that you have a much better chance because you're taking a lot more shots. Um, the, the downside to this model is that you limit your upside because you're giving away part of the upside to a potential partner. Uh, and so on the right-hand side here, this is kind of a workflow of, of how this works. So the project generating company will go out and stake some ground. So that could be somewhere between 50 and $500,000. And then if you're lucky enough, you can bring in a partner right away. Um, and do a deal. And if you're not lucky enough, then you might have to go out and do some early stage exploration. And so what you're trying to do is work up the target enough to attract somebody to come in and spend uh, the real dollars, which is typically spent on diamond drilling. And then the way the deals typically work is that you typically get carried to a certain point as the project generator. So you might get carried up to a, a study, which could be a, a, a PEA, a pre-feasibility study or feasibility study. And then you end up with a 30% interest, for example, in the project, um, which you didn't need to finance to get up to that point. So let's say you're carried to a feasibility study and that cost, let's say $500 million to get up to that point. 
So as the project generator, you didn't have to spend anything to get up to that point, and you have a 30% interest at the end of it. So this is good for shareholders because there's a lot less dilution because you're not raising money uh, to spend money on exploration to get up to that point. So mineral exploration, what are the chances of success? There are a number of different metrics that are out there in the public space. And so some people refer to one in a thousand chance of success, one in 3000 chance of success. And so we'll look at these a little bit and try and dig down into these numbers a bit. Um, so one interesting way to look at this is that uh, there was a couple guys in the 90s, Stevens and Burley, they looked at a number of different R&D businesses across different economic sectors. And what they found was that it takes approximately 3,000 raw ideas to make one commercial success. And so this could be in consumer products, it could be in biotech, um, or it could be in, in technology. And so there's kind of a, a broad correlation between R&D sectors across all of these different economic sectors. And mineral exploration fits into this. Um, it's really the R&D sector of the mining business. And so one key difference with mineral exploration is that it's not just a numbers game. And I don't think you can just think of it numerically as in one in a thousand or one in 3000, because there is a spatial component to where mineral deposits are. And so we have to think about where these mineral deposits are and, and how big they are in space. So I'll be talking about a few different definitions. Um, for simplicity's sake, I've, I've simplified the normal versions of tier one, tier two, and tier three. So people have some economic uh, criteria that they use for these, but I've, I've really simplified. I've said tier one is greater than a 10 million ounce gold equivalent or $20 billion gross metal value in the ground. Tier two is, is greater than a 5 million ounce gold equivalent deposit, and a tier three deposit is greater than a 2 million ounce equivalent deposit. So we'll start out looking at Canada and a couple ways to try and quantify um, the chances of success. And so one way that you can do this is you can start thinking about how much area needs to be explored to produce a significant deposit. So in Canada, there are a total of 63 deposits that are greater than 10 million ounce gold equivalent. And there are 61 million hectares of mineral claims in Canada. So if you just divide those two numbers, it's about 968,000 hectares per uh, tier one or greater than 10 million ounce equivalent deposit. So just keep that number in mind. It's, let's round up. It's about a million hectares of mineral claims to get to a, a greater than 10 million ounce uh, equivalent deposit. So we'll scale down a bit. So going down to the greater than 5 million ounce uh, equivalent deposits. So there's 127 of these in Canada, 61 million hectares of mineral claims. So it's about half a million hectares of mineral claims per tier two deposit. And then going down to greater than 2 million ounce equivalent. So there's 231 and you divide those numbers. So that's about 264,000 hectares of mineral claims per tier, tier three deposit. So I'm going to jump down from the, the country scale down to the terrain scale. And this is a map that people will probably know quite well. This is uh, the eastern gold fields in the Yogaran Craton in, in WA. And so there's about 220 million ounces of gold endowment in the eastern gold fields across 56 deposits. And so if you were going into this area as a new explorer, the first thing you have to decide is where you want to stake claims and explore. So as geoscientists, we know that these de deposits form in certain geologic scenarios and that not all the ground is perspective. For the Eastern gold fields, we might be going in to look for orogenic gold and we might look at proximity to first order structures, structure density, structure geometry, metamorphic gradients, presence of late basin, polymictic conglomerates or presence of lamprophores. But how do we quantify this? 
And so what people typically do or some people do is they, they build prospectivity maps. And so prospectivity mapping is used to visualize areas that are more prospective for mineral deposits versus areas that aren't as prospective. And I'm sure lots of people are familiar with this, but the, the simple explanation is that you take all of these different geologic factors, you put them on a zero to one scale, and then you add them all up and you end up with a, a prospectivity map that should show you where there's the similar characteristics as, as big deposits. So in this prospectivity study, 14% um, of the land area captures 82% of the deposits. And so that's 46 out of 56 deposits. Pretty much all of this ground is staked up in the Eastern gold fields. There's about 105,000 square kilometers of claim staked, um, about 13,000 13, square kilometers overlap with prospective ground. And so that's about 12.4% of the claims are located on prospective ground. So the flip side to that is that 87.8% .8 of the state claims are located outside of these prospectivity corridors. So when you're coming in at a terrain scale, it's really essential to understand prospectivity and land selection is really essential. And if you don't get this right at the beginning and you're exploring in a place where there's no any deposits, then you're, you're hooped from the very beginning. So we'll go down to scale again. And this is a geology map of the, the Cadillac break area in the Abitibi Greenstone Belt in Quebec, in Canada. And so the Abitibi is the second most endowed um, area in the world for gold. So there's about 280 million ounces of gold endowment. At a 2 million ounce cutoff, there's about 105 million ounces of gold in this 150 kilometer uh, section of the Cadillac break. And so what we'll look at is how are these gold deposits distributed along this prospective structural corridor or district. And so we've come down from the terrain scale, we've identified a prospective district, and now we want to see the distribution of deposits along uh, at the district scale. So we do the same thing. Um, we, we make a prospectivity map of the Abitibi Greenstone Belt. And so what I've outlined here is the, the highest prospectivity area along the Cadillac break. And so when you put a buffer around this area, it's about 120,000 hectares, or to be exact, 120,303 hectares. So when you divide the number of deposits by that number of hectares. So it's about 24,000 hectares per 5 million ounce deposit. And then it's about 8,000 hectares per 2 million ounce deposit. But this isn't really an accurate representation of the spatial density of ounces in the ground. And I think you really need to dig into this a little bit further. And so how do we do this? So we're looking at the 120,303 hectares. And when we start looking at the actual deposit footprints and outlines, then you can really start to look at these statistics spatially a bit more. So for greater than 2 million ounce deposits, 210 hectares hosts the 100 and 100.5 million ounces of gold. So that is 0.175% of the prospective area hosts 100 million ounces of gold. For greater than 5 million ounce deposits, it's 75 hectares that host 68 million ounces of gold, and that's 0.625% of the prospective area. And greater than 10 million ounce deposits, uh, which is most of the greater than 5 million ounce deposits, so it's 72 hectares that host 61 million ounces of gold and that's 0.059% of the prospective area. So the total area without greater than 2 million ounce deposits is 120,000 hectares, 120,093 hectares. And so the point of this is saying is that it's very easy to acquire the wrong ground, even when you're in one of the most prospective areas on the planet for gold mineralization. And the way that you mitigate this risk is that you acquire as much prospective ground as humanly possible and screen it all systematically. So another thing that I think is really important to look at is exploration maturity. 
And there's a number of ways that you can quantify exploration maturity. One of these ways is with drilling density. And so on this map, this is the drilling density on a grid that's 500 meters by 500 meter grid cells. So the average strike length of a 2 million ounce deposit along the Cadillac break is about 1400 meters. So that's about three grid cells. So if you go in and start looking at this, um, you know that a, a, de a deposit crosses three grid cells. If a block contains 500 meters of drilling and has not intersected a significant deposit, what are the chances that you can fit a deposit in between drill holes in that block? So of this 120,303 hectares of prospective area, 45,000 hectares has greater than 500 meters of drilling per cell. So that's 38% of the prospective area. And then about 30,000 hectares has greater than 1,000 meters per 500 meter cell. So about a quarter of the area. So to illustrate this a little bit, this is the Canadian Malarctic deposit. And with a grid cell of 500 meters by 500 meters of blocks. Um, and then I've put 1,000 meters of diamond drilling in each one of these blocks to illustrate what this looks like. And so when you just randomly put um, 1,000 meters of drilling in each block, you would most likely have intersected the mineralization that's in the Canadian Malarctic deposit, which is about 18 million ounces of gold. And then if you didn't intersect significant mineralization in these blocks, would you expect that there is a significant deposit there that you've missed? That's what I think, why I think exploration maturity is very important to look at because if you go in and try and um, do something that everybody else has already done, you're not gonna be successful. So this is one way to look at it. This is in 2D. Um, the next step to this would be to take this into 3D. So I'll move on to the targeting risk. And so in terms of targeting, I think there's five tool sets that we have to work with. And those would be geochemistry, geophysics, alteration, stratigraphy, and lithology and structure. And so I'll run through each one of these um, and, and talk about the risks that are inherent in all of these uh, targeting tool sets. So this is a map of the Abitibi Greenstone Belt, and this is one of the significant VMS districts in the world. So Extrata became the eventual owner of the Naranda District, uh, which is down here by, uh, from a series of acquisitions when they took out Naranda and, and Falcon Bridge. And in the early 2000s, from 2001 to 2006, Extrata flew a Megatem survey over all of these polygons here, um, which is a huge part of the Abitibi Greenstone Belt. They flew about 2.2 million hectares of ground, uh, 180,000 line kilometers. They picked up 40,000 EM anomalies. 2,500 were selected for further follow-up and 268 diamond drill tests were completed and they made zero economic discoveries. This is one from the Kenorland Minerals uh, stable and this is looking at geochemistry. And so this is from our Healy project in Alaska. Uh, Kenorland originally optioned this project from Newmont who had done a, a terrain scale blake sampling program and it, it really vectored into this area, uh, which was followed up by soil geochemistry. <clears throat> we defined multiple uh, one to two kilometer gold, arsenic, and antimony anomalies, and these look like excellent drill targets. We went out and drilled these and were quite disappointed. The best drill intersect out of about 5,000 meters of drilling was 13 meters at 1.2 grams. And so there was a lot of smoke encountered um, but the expectations were quite a bit higher based on the soil geochemistry anomaly in this terrain, especially when we compared it to other deposits uh, in, in similar lithologies and terrain in this area. So alteration. So this is looking at a project that's owned by Mirasol Resources, and this is their Gorbia property. Uh, this is in northern Chile in the Mayo Pliocene volcanic arc. And so this was picked out 
because of extensive hydrothermal alteration that was mapped with Aster spectral data. They went out on the ground and were mapping and mapped out uh, extensive steam heated alteration and brecciation at surface. This got Yamana interested enough in the property and they optioned it from 2015 to 2018, drilled about 11,000 meters. Best intersect was 114 meters at about a gram per ton. Yamana exited and Newmont came, or sorry, Newcrest came in and optioned in 2019 and drilled another 5,000 meters and intersected 164 meters at 0.52 grams. And so both of those drill intersects were in this breccia here. Um, they drilled a lot of smoke, but the alteration of breccias at surface have not led to a significant discovery yet. And then I'll talk to you about structure a little bit. So this is a mag map of an area along the Cadillac break. And so doing a mag and turf is, is obviously one of the first things that most people do in an area when they are going in and, and thinking about targeting. So I've drawn some lines on the map here. Um, you know, you can pick out probably a lot more structures and lineaments, um, but these are a few. And so what you would typically do is do this kind of exercise and then come up with some targets based on where we think the gold should be. So a couple of these here. So I'll start up in the top left. So this is the intersection between a first and second order structure. Uh, we've got a nice uh, axial plane that's trending into the first order structure here. The first order structure takes the jog through here. And so that's typically a decent place to be. Um, same kind of story as up here. Across this, this north-south structure, there seems to be a lot more complexity in the magnetic units. And this area, the structures seem to be coming together um, with a bit of a jog, so that's potentially good. And then another axial plane trending into the first order structure. And over here, we've got another intersection happening. So those you know, might look like, like good targets. We put the deposit outlines on and we may have picked out this deposit. So that's the Marban deposit, which is about two and a half million ounces of gold. But we probably would have missed the Canadian Malarctic deposit, which is 18 million ounces. And that would be because Canadian Malarctic is hosted in classic sedimentary rocks that are cut by felsic dikes. And it's got very little mag signature. So targeting risk and, and how do you mitigate that? The sweet spot is really where all of these targeting data sets are suggesting that mineralization is present. If there's one missing ingredient, that's really all that's needed to make a great target turn into a failure. And then even if all of these data sets are overlapping and it looks like a great target, it still takes a huge amount of luck in order to actually make a discovery. And so the way that you generate luck is by testing an enormous number of targets. And the challenge with this is that testing targets or a huge number of targets is very costly. So we'll start looking at those costs a little bit. And um, this is a map of Quebec and the greater than 10 million ounce uh, gold equivalent deposits on the left and the greater than 5 million ounce gold equivalent deposits on the right. So Quebec has a really great database and similar to Australia, which also has great databases. Um, and so we can use these databases to come up with an idea of what it actually costs to discover one of these deposits. And then by using the um, all in drilling costs that we have. So in Quebec, there are 156,000 drill holes in the database, which is about 26,000 meters of drilling. There's one big assumption here that I'll use, and that's that most of the drilling in the assessment report databases is from early stage exploration, because once a company has drilled off a resource or they're going towards resource definition, they typically don't need any more exploration credits to keep the claims in good standing, and they typically stop reporting because they don't need um, the, the credits anymore. So uh, when we look at this, there are 17 deposits that are greater than 10 million ounce equivalent. And so when you take out the R and ore deposits, that's nine deposits greater than 10 million ounces. There's 25 deposits greater than 5 million ounces. And without iron ore, it's 17. 
and then 43 deposits greater than 2 million ounces equivalent, and that's 35 without iron ore. So when you start dividing those numbers, come up with a number of meters drilled to get one of those, the greater than 10 million ounce equivalent without iron ore deposits is about 2.9 million meters. The greater than 5 million ounce equivalents are 1.53 million meters, and then greater than 2 million ounce is about 770,000 meters. So when you convert that to a discovery cost by multiplying by an all-in drilling cost, which in Quebec is probably about $250 a meter, that is about $725 million in drilling to get one greater than 10 million ounce gold equivalent deposit, $383 million to get a greater than 5 million ounce uh, gold equivalent deposit, and about $192 million to get a greater than 2 million ounce gold equivalent deposit. So another way to look at this is by using other people's great um, statistics. And this is coming out of a Rio Tinto presentation in 2010. And Rio Tinto looked back at the last 12 years and, and tried to calculate their discovery cost. And so between those 12 years, or let's say within that decade, um, because these are the, the deposits that they found, uh, they found eight tier one deposits. And their total exploration expenditures um, in 2009 dollars was 1.9 billion US for, for that decade, which is about 2.6 billion US in 2022 dollars. So the exploration cost per tier one discovery that they put in the ground in 2022 dollars is about 320 million. And they were able to divest quite a few tier two deposits, which really offset their, their tier one discovery cost. And so after divestitures in 2022 dollars, their net cost for a tier one discovery was about $111 million. So another way to look at this is to really scale out and look at the industry in general. And so the metals economics group, SNL and S&P have collected exploration budget data from companies over the last decades. And so this chart shows the breakdown of budgets and the total budgets um, and the total number of companies that were reporting at the time. So I think the key column here is looking at this Greenfields column. So for the decade of 2010 to 2019, the total Greenfields budget was $35.7 billion. And so let's see what we came out with. So during this decade, there were 23 deposits with a gross metal value of greater than $20 billion in the ground, which is about a 10 million ounce gold equivalent. There was 35 billion that was spent in exploration. So that's about a $1.55 billion exploration cost per discovery. And I stuck this plot in here um, at the bottom, which really shows that since 1997, grassroots exploration uh, has been going down in terms of the overall percentage of where budgets are allocated. <clears throat> and so this is really a problem because this is what's driving up the, the discovery costs is that not many people are actually spending money on greenfields exploration and not many uh, deposits are actually being found. So one other risk I think that's important to talk about is time. And so on the top left hand here, this is a chart that is showing the number of exploration campaigns before a Greenfields discovery. And this is for Canadian deposits that are greater than 2 million ounces of gold. So from this, the median number of campaigns is three exploration campaigns. Um, as we start to look undercover, it gets more difficult to find new mineral deposits. So I think it's safe to assume it's probably two to three years from the initiation of exploration up to a new discovery if you get everything right. So on the bottom here, this chart is looking at um, the number of years it takes from discovery up to acquisition or takeout. And so this is looking at 35 transactions that were over $100 million. And so the median time frame from discovery to takeout is five years. So the typical time frame to go from the initiation of exploration up to exit, which is the maximum value, is seven to eight years. So within the, the seven to eight year time frame, we all know that things can change really quickly. 
the market could completely fall apart. And so when you started exploring, maybe maybe the commodities markets were up. By the time that you've actually gotten the deposit ready to be taken out, everything's fallen apart and it's you've just kind of wasted uh, a bit of time and, and shareholders' money to get up to that point. So now I'll start looking at companies and this is a chart of project generator companies. And this is from talking to people that are following the space quite a bit. I've come up with a list of about a hundred companies um, that have been active and utilizing the project generation model in the last decade. Now this list may not be complete, but I think it gives a, a decent idea in terms of order of magnitude. And so it's about a hundred companies, I think, that, uh, that are actively going out and trying to execute on this model. Now, when we look at exploration companies, so currently right now, 52% of the global mining and exploration companies are listed on Canadian stock exchanges. And then 48% are listed elsewhere in the world. So this is a statistic that people have talked about many times. It's about half of the half of the equity for exploration is raised in Canada, half is elsewhere. So I think you can extrapolate that backwards for the last decade and assume it's probably been about the same. So half in Canada, half in the world, half elsewhere in the world. When you look back at mining issuers in Canada, um, we have a, a database called CDAR, and that's where all publicly traded companies have to file documentation for the securities commissions. And so when we look at the decade between 2010 and 2019, in Canada, there were about 4,200 mining and exploration companies that filed documents on CDAR. And so looking at these, about 5% of these companies are shell companies or companies that had changes of business. So I think it's pretty safe to assume that there's about 4,000 companies that were mining and mineral exploration companies based in Canada during that decade. So if we use that ratio of about half the companies are Canadian, half are elsewhere, and we take that 4,000 over the decade and extrapolate outwards, that would mean that there's about 8,000 mining and mineral exploration companies that have been listed on global stock exchanges for that decade. So for 23 discoveries that are greater than 10 million ounce gold equivalent, um, that was made by 8,000 companies. And so that is resulting in one discovery for every 350 companies. Now, when we go back to this map of, of the greater than 10 million ounce equivalent deposits, so there were 23 of the deposits again, 35 billion spent on exploration, Project generator companies were involved in four out of the 23 of these discoveries. And so these would be the Casca Bell or Alpala porphyry deposit in Ecuador, and that was Cornerstone Capital. The Timok deposit in Serbia, uh, which was Reservoir Minerals, Treaty Creek in the Golden Triangle in British Columbia, and that was Teuton in American Creek. And, and the White Rivers JV in South Africa, and that is a company that is majority owned by Mark Creasy. So we had a hundred companies in the last decade that were operating this model and four of them were involved in world-class discoveries. And so that's a one in 25 chance that a project generator was involved in world-class discovery versus a one in 350 chance that an exploration company was involved in one of these discoveries. So that's a 14 times more, you're 14 times more likely uh, that a project generator will be part of a major discovery than a, an exploration company. And so digging into one of these a little bit, so this is Soul Gold uh, versus Cornerstone Capital and their share price performance, uh, which is associated with the Alpala uh, copper porphyry discovery on the Cascabel property. So Cornerstone Capital originally optioned the Cascabel property to Soul Gold in July of 2012 and amended the agreement in 2013 before drilling. Soul Gold could acquire 85% of the Cascabel project by completing $1.2 million equity investment in Cornerstone and then also committing $2.5 million on exploration expenditures. 
And then in return, so Cornerstone retained a 15% carried interest up to a bankable feasibility study. And then if Cornerstone diluted below a 10% interest in the project, it converted to a half percent NSR, which was viable for a seven and a half million. So the first holes went into the Alpala target and returned significant porphyry mineralization in early 2014. And that's right here. And Soul Gold released visuals. They hit 112 meter stock work zone with, uh, with boronite and calcopyrite. And after that, um, they started releasing drill results. So hole five intersected 672 meters at 0.93 copper and 0.91 gold. And so when you look at the stock chart, you can see that Cornerstone's stock price um, basically mirrors Soul Gold's performance. And so this is, this is going all the way through. So uh, at this point in 2016, Newcrest had offered uh, to acquire 10% of Soul Gold. Cornerstone is moving upwards at the same time as Soul Gold. BHP comes in and offers higher, um, and it keeps going like this. The maiden resource is, is released here, which is about a billion tons of 0.68 copper equivalent. Um, BHP acquires 6.1% of Soul Gold from Guyana Gold Fields. But the amazing thing is that Cornerstone Capital's share price performance is, is echoing Soul Gold. So the thing is, if you invested in both Cornerstone and Soul Gold in January of 2013, which was before the discovery was made, you would have made a 6.8x return on Soul Gold and a 5.1x return on Cornerstone. So if you think about this in terms of the numbers that we talked about before in terms of your chances with a project generator versus an exploration company. What you're saying is, would you, or the question would be, would you accept a 33% additional return for a 14X more risk? So now I'll jump back to Canada and just talk about Pinorland and, and how we're doing things, uh, which I think is in line with this model. So Kenorland Minerals has interest in 1.4 million hectares of mineral claims in Canada and Alaska, and that's about 2.2% of all mineral claims in Canada. And so these are all being advanced through sole funding or through partnerships with major mining companies or, or by junior explorers. Um, so far of this, we've, we've made one significant gold discovery, which is probably in the camp of uh, the greater than 2 million ounce and potentially in the greater than 5 million ounce deposits. And this is really, we're just getting started and there will be more to come. So our costs, when we've been screening ground, it all kind of boils down or averages out to about $35 a hectare. And these costs are completely different depending on the terrain that you're in. Um, in some areas, we're, we're drilling through glacial lacustrine clay with a sonic drill to get a till sample underneath. So those are very expensive screening costs. And then in other areas, we're doing wide-spaced regional till sampling, which is relatively cheap. But I think when you average it out across Canada, just to give an order of magnitude kind of idea, it's about, let's say $35 a hectare. So when we looked at this, there was about one significant, or let's say world-class greater than 10 million ounce gold equivalent deposit per 1 million hectares in Canada. So in order to screen 1 million hectares of ground, that's about $35 million in pre-drilling exploration that's needed. And so this is really difficult to do for a junior mining company. Um, and this is why we are operating under this uh, business model. And so by utilizing partner funding to Norland screening massive amounts of ground and running the company at net zero cost because we have income that's offsetting the GNA. And so just to recap everything, so exploration discovery risk, why does the project generator business model make sense? So looking at the risk factors, location risk or exploring in the wrong place, geologic prospectivity. So when you're looking at the terrain scale, it's really a small amount of ground that hosts the majority of the deposits. And so in the Yilgarn, it was 14% of the ground, or sorry, in Eastern gold fields, it was 14% of the ground that hosted 82% of the deposits. And then at the district scale, deposits are hosted within a tiny percentage of that prospective area. So the, the 60 million ounces of gold was hosted in 0.06% of the prospective area in the Cadillac area. 
And then exploration maturity before prospective ground is staked, it's really critical to understand whether there's room to put a major deposit in between drill holes that are already there. And so the sweet spot is really finding geologically prospective ground that has low exploration maturity. Going to the targeting risk. So each one of the targeting tool sets that we have has a huge amount of risk if it's used in isolation. The sweet spot is obviously when you have all five of these targeting tool sets that are supporting the area. And then even when a target has all of the vectors um, from each one of these targeting tool sets, it, it takes a huge amount of luck to make a discovery. And the way that we make luck is to go out and test a huge number of targets. So financial risk, so using a number of different metrics, the cost of finding a world-class deposit or a greater than 10 million ounce equivalent deposit ranges from about 400 million to about one and a half billion dollars. So this amount of Greenfield's exploration expenditures is difficult to impossible for a junior exploration company to execute on. And if this magnitude or intensity of capital isn't committed to Greenfield's exploration, then the odds of a single exploration company making a world-class discovery are very thin. So the key takeaway points, number one, a large amount of capital is required to be spent on exploration and it, the exploration has to be conducted in a systematic fashion on perspective and low maturity ground in order to be successful. Number two, if exploration is thought of in terms of statistics and probability of success, it can really be thought of as a business that will give a return on investment rather than a casino. Number three, Understanding and deciding where to explore is one of the most critical steps in the exploration process. And if you're exploring in the wrong place, your chances of success are zero. And number four, which is really the reason of putting this talk together, the debate about whether the best business model is the Explore Co or project generation route is irrelevant. And what really guarantees market success is finding a significant mineral deposit. And then the project generation route offers a lot more shots on net. So that's it. And I'll throw it out there to Jess and, and questions and comments. Thank you so much, Francis. That was, um, yeah, that was really interesting.